I used to think before I ran that there had to be some basis of truth before someone could allege it. It just made sense to me. Growing up as a Southern Baptist, or not. And, and my father always talking about truth and honesty. I never anticipated these types of attacks. Call me a bit naive, I suppose I am to a certain extent, but the idea that they would try to use my first cousin against me on a TV commercial, that was something that never dawned on me. A lot of this stuff never dawned on me. But it does show a degree of desperation on their part. And we know why. We know why. The last two polls we've seen just in the last weekend show us up by four points and seven points respectively. why they want to talk about anything and everything but that Congress voting record. They want to take you down this path. Take you down this path. They want to call me a trial lawyer. They want to say I'm somehow friendly to meth. <laughs> anything and everything but a 42-year record of big government, big spending, and liberalism. Our message is the same. We haven't criticized Dad Cochran. We've talked about his record, and that's fair. Because we're talking about making policy here, and that's fair. Ladies and gentlemen, your country's in trouble. It's been in trouble for a long time. And it's getting worse by the day. The idea that we can sit back and not engage in this fight strikes me as reckless. I am not one day going to tell my two sons about a once great republic we were unable to save. And I'm not going to tell them that in our time of need, their daddy didn't take some form of action. Now granted, they told me they would try to take my head off, didn't they? Yes. On day one. They, they should have told me right then that this was a no holds barred type of situation. But it doesn't matter. What matters is that we fight with courage. What matters is that we stand for our beliefs. And it's not just me. I'm just a messenger. That's all I am. It's you. It's always been about you. It's always been about the people. We have to re-engage our system of government. If you value conservatism, if you value your God, if you value your country, now is the time to engage. We don't have six more years. We don't have two more years. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, when Senator Cochran went to Washington in 1973, Richard Nixon was your president. Consider that for a moment. The national debt at the time was roughly about $400 billion. That's B, billion. Look at me for a second, conservatives. We've added $400 billion to the debt since I announced in October. The debt spans at $17.5 trillion. We have $200 trillion more dollars in unfunded liabilities. That is the promises that we owe to this generation. We borrow 46 cents out of every dollar we spend just to get by. And yet there are parties, there are people in my party that say we still need to send that Cochran back to Washington so he can keep spending. If that is the position of the Republican Party in the most conservative state in the Republic, then we are doomed. We're doomed. If we are that selfish about our children's future, if we are that greedy, not willing to at least understand that at some point the adults have to enter the room and say, you know what? The court spending has to stop. Right. You know what? We got to balance the budget. And you don't do that with tax increases. You do it with tax cuts. Right. And you do it with reduced spending. We don't have a taxing problem. We have a spending problem. Senator Cochran is Exhibit A in your government's spending problem. When he arrived, it's $400 billion or so. Right now, it stands at $17.5 trillion, and we can't find a single vote that he's cast to reduce spending, to reduce the rate of expenditures. We can't find fiscal responsibility in his voting, and that shouldn't surprise us because he shares a different ideology than I do. His ideology is about an expanding government. It is about big government. That's why he takes so much of yours and spends it. I presume it's better than you can, he thinks. It's your money to keep, not Washington's. That's right. It's yours. It's always been yours. And here's the thing. His votes run across a wide spectrum. First, Obamacare. 
it's not the show votes that matter. It's not the lip service that matters. It's not the press releases that matter. What matters is, is when you finally have a chance to cut the head off of that snake, do you do it? That's right. Yeah. When you finally have a chance to kill it, do you stand and fight? That's right. That day in Washington, D.C., Senator Ted Cruz stood on that floor, a 42-year-old senator with nine months of experience, and he shed political blood on that floor for you. Yeah. He fought for you. Mike Lee, another young man, joined him. Rand Paul, another, joined him. Others came into the room to fight. Senator Cochran, despite his promises, he voted to fund Obamacare, not once, but twice. Right. It's inexcusable. If you leave from the most conservative state in the republic, you should fight like you're from the most conservative state in the republic. Yeah. And it's not just Obamacare. It's not just Obamacare. He's voted for Medicaid funded abortions. He's voted to raise his own pay every time the vote has been before him. He's voted to raise the debt ceiling at least 20 times. We failed 13 in just the last 10 years to the tune of $8 trillion. If you can imagine a vote, whether it's foreign policy, fiscal policy, or domestic policy, he has betrayed the conservative movement. Then that doesn't make him a bad man. I like Senator Cochran. I think he's probably a good man. It's just a different ideology. And it was born in a different era. It was born in a different time. In 1973, I suppose it was fashionable to rush to Washington and grab as much money as you could and rush home with it. But when you're $17.5 trillion in the hole, that's not fashionable any longer. It's not responsible any longer. It's time for a new era of fighter, a new era of warrior. Ted Cruz has shown us that. I believe they've shown us that. Mississippi should not have to depend on Texas to lead our fights for us. <laughs> When you send me to Washington, when you send me to Washington, the next time Tess Cruz fights on that floor, the next time Mike Lee fights on that floor, a son of Mississippi will stand right by them and fight. <laughs> about the voter record because that's important. That's why we're here. That's what he doesn't want to talk about. All right, conservatives, look at me for a minute. Serious question. Hope the press is paying no attention here. For all you inspection, I'm watching you. <laughs> Barack Obama is the worst president in this country's history. Absolutely. Name one fight, name one fight that Senator Cochran has led against Barack Obama. None. 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 What good is seniority if you're not going to stand your ground? <laughs> 42 years in Washington, name one bill he's authored, just one, that furthered the conservative cause. Zero. Zero. What good is seniority if your ideology is not conservative? It's interesting, isn't it? What about this? What good is seniority when your country's already bankrupt? I hear these arguments about saving back so we can keep spending. We're not spending our kids' money anymore. We're not spending our great grandkids' money anymore. We're spending our great 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 grandchildren's money right now. That is immoral. It's wrong and it has to stop. Ladies and gentlemen, there's a reason we've received the endorsements we've received. From Sarah Palin to Glenn Beck to Mark Levin. There's a reason these outside, these outside groups, they say, are coming into Mississippi. They're not outsiders, they're conservative warriors, they're conservative champions. Women like Phyllis Shafley. Phyllis Shafley is no outsider, she's a champion for our movement and our cause. They're coming to Mississippi because they see an opportunity in this state. It has nothing to do with me. It has nothing to do with Senator Cochran. 
they see a chance to create a conservative revival, a resurgence, right here from Mississippi. And the reason for that is simple. We are still people of character. We value what the founders value, liberty and freedom, constitutionalism, right? Balanced budgets. They know there's fertile soil here to create change, and that's why they're here. That's why they're fighting. Now we must not disappoint. My party, my state, and my country deserves better than what we've gotten. I'll wrap up with this, then I'll answer your questions. I think you all understand my background a bit. I've been a Republican since I can remember. Since I was about 13 years old. I didn't know the first thing about policy, or philosophy, or law. But there was an actor from California that would sit right in front of the TV camera, in front of his desk, and he would look directly at the American people, and he would communicate his desires, and his wishes, and his ambition. And my father called me in and he said, son, you've got to see this. This is incredible. And I sit there and watch Ronald Reagan speak to me. And he talked about those things I like to talk about. He talked about liberty freedom, and the Constitution, and God's budgets, and traditional family values. We talked about being good stewards of the taxpayer dollar, remember? And I said, well, that, that must be a Republican. That's what we used to believe. <coughs> How stands your party today? We go to restore it. We go to win it back and restore its conscience. And then, and then we restore the conscience of the United States government with you. You storm those walls, I'll follow you. It's always your movement. It's always been yours. Just take it for a change. Get out there and energize for a change. We have two weeks. We're ahead in the polls. They're going to throw everything at us they can. Put your chest out. Be strong. Be tough. Be courageous. Fight and we'll win this race. Thank you. Mississippi Law Enforcement Officers Association. I've been the legislature of the year for mothers against drunk driving. That should tell you that I'm not the one. Okay? I'm not. I'm really not. The bill they're talking about involved a ban of pseudo-federal products in our perp stores, in our convenience stores, in our drug stores. Basically, if you like the pseudo-fed, the kind that works, they took it off the shelves and they put it, you can only get it by prescription. Remember? Well, let's talk about that for a minute. We didn't go into that vote blind. I did my job. I researched the vote. I read the bill. And here's what happened. Oregon had adopted that very law just a few years before it came before the body. So we knew we had a test state, a model, if you will, to see does it work, does it not work. Because bear in mind, thousands and thousands and thousands of Mississippians were going to be inconvenienced. You could no longer get your nasal decongestant that worked, so you had to go to the doctor's office. So if you're going to inconvenience thousands, does the real work? Okay, Oregon. Guess what happened to meth use in Oregon after they implemented this prescription only to the patient? It increased. <clears throat> you know why? Because the Mexican drug cartels moved into Oregon with a more pure form of the drug. Now, here's the thing. Meth labs did go down, but that's not the subject behind the legislation. You're trying to decrease meth use. Yes. It gets worse for you. Guess what else went up? Health insurance costs. Premiums. Do you know why? Because now instead of going to the drugstore and buying $7 for the Sudafed, you got to go to the doctor and spend $170. Guess what else went up? Medicaid. It drove Medicaid costs up, it drove insurance costs up, and it wasn't working as advertised. 
It's bad policy. Now granted, people may think it's popular policy, it's bad policy. And that's why sitting here today, only two states have adopted that policy. Mississippi and Oregon. And the reason the other states haven't, there's, there's less restrictive ways to control the flow as opposed to inconveniency everybody and drop up the cost for everybody. That's why I guess the word up. Yes. When we send you to Washington, when we send you a question or a comment, do you have your staff, unlike the current incumbent, at least give us the courtesy of a response? You will, and you'll get more than that. The way Senator Cochran has been answering questions for years is, he always says, we're undecided. Exactly. As you can tell, I'm a pretty decided kind of guy. You'll know the answer. You'll know the answer. You'll know how I'm going to vote. Uh, I'll listen to the people. I'll do my research. I'm a conservative. My allegiance is to the Constitution, the people of this state. I'm going to listen to them. I'm going to vote my principles. And then I'm going to come home and hold town halls. I'm going to come home and discuss it. I'm not going to live in Washington, D.C. I'm going to live in Coastville, Mississippi. That's my home. I found out exactly what you just said. And I thought to myself at the time, Chris McDevitt doesn't have a problem. That's like I think that Hopper does. He's got an issue with the He doesn't understand the American issue. Neither does his campaign. You know, his campaign, now bear in mind, I don't, I don't think, and I'm not certain about this, but I always give Senator Cochran the benefit of a doubt when it comes to the nastiness. Now, his campaign has been very nasty, but I'm not sure he really is the one pushing that nasty. I don't know. Um, I know that um, to put a commercial on like that, it's just absolute desperation. I am a two-term Republican state senator and they accuse me of being friendly with men. Think about this. Think of let that sink in for a second. I'm a two-term Republican state senator. I've carried their water for them. I have fought for them. I have voted with them. I've given them money in campaigns. I've gone door to door for them. I've been a Republican since I was 13. And those same people that were my colleagues just a few weeks ago are now saying I'm friendly to men. Consider that for a second. It's a degree of desperation that should not be in this place. They should be talking about his voting record. Exactly. Oh, better yet, better yet, it's fair. He should be standing right here, right now in front of you talking about it. Yeah. something here in this environment when the United States Senator sees a president for example exceeding his constitutional boundaries yeah, exactly. when he sees a president shunning the Constitution silence is complicity yeah. the idea that he would be silent for the last 20 years is a real problem from my standpoint and I haven't heard him raise his voice in objection I haven't heard him discuss the issues he owes it to you to be your mouthpiece in Washington he should be discussing it. A senator has basically two jobs. One is to legislate, which none of them right now are doing a very good job at that. <laughs> the other is to communicate a message because they're given the benefit of a bully pulpit. He ought to stand there every chance he gets and defend Mississippi's conservative values. You know what, though? I, I'm not surprised that he won't come home and debate me. He hasn't been debating the Democrats either, has he? No. Yeah. 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 Look, it's a simple calculation. If everything they're saying about me is true, he needs to stand on stage with me. Better yet, he can get on the bus with me. We'll travel around together county by county for the next two weeks. I'll get on this bus. We'll travel together county by county. We'll sit down and we'll have a conversation. Not much linking, not name calling, a conversation. And it begs the question, why won't he come home to Mississippi and meet with people? Why won't he answer questions with the press? Why won't he come home to debate? Those are questions you all have to care about. He owes it to you. Question. I have a question. It's just, I have been wondering about this, and I 
been like a one person just saying it over and over again, but I don't hear anybody else talking about this. To me, it's the worst quote I've ever heard of Hockley living. And it's that Treaty of the uh, Sea where he voted to give our oceans to the United Nations. I mean, how many people in this state actually understand that? Treaty power is a very powerful thing. Treaties are placed high in our law, and they, they take great priority. That's the problem. I'm not a big fan of international treaties. It never helped me. Well, I was just thinking, what a great thing that we need to get that word out for the next two weeks. And we did that. It's so well, One of the ones that really bothered me, this spoke for the Stark Treaty, S-T-A-R-T. That showed weakness to Russia. Uh -huh. Number two, and perhaps more alarming is, why on earth would he have supported Chuck Hagel for Secretary of Defense? Hey. Yeah. Because, because he said it was his butt, well, and so he was going to vote for him. I, I okay. called him about that. That's, that's part of the problem. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's part of the problem. We didn't send him there to make, we didn't there to make buddies. Right. We sent him there to fight for our values. Yeah. Right. Now here's the thing, Chuck Hagel. Chuck Hagel is an extension, of course, of Barack Obama, as you know. Yeah. Chuck Hagel, his nomination could have been blocked. You know that, don't you? Yes. And the Republicans had the votes to stop his confirmation. Cockney voted with the Democrats. Yeah. No, it's worse than that. He was the first Republican to cross over. That's right. He was the first. He took three of his friends with him, and they confirmed Chuck Hagel. Just like he confirmed uh, uh, Kerry, John Kerry for Secretary of State. Just like he confirmed Ruth Bader Ginsburg for the United yeah. States Supreme Court. Yeah. Yeah. At some point, conservatives have to learn to fight again. We're not going up there to get along. We can be polite, we can be kind, and we can be unyielding, strong. It's time to fight with the backbone again. We've been compromising for 40 years, and it's got a $17.5 trillion in debt. Uh, last week, Harry Reid and, and uh, several of his Democrat colleagues in the Senate talked about uh, reversing the current earmark plan in order to bring it back suggesting that they simply cannot govern without your money. Sure. I just want to know where you stand on that, where you think Senator Cox is standing. Oh, that's, I'm so glad you asked that. Earmarks. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, there are a few things in the world, particularly in government, are more dangerous than earmarks. Here's why, despite what you hear from the other side. Earmarks are abused, as you know. And this is the way they're abused. Senator A walks up to Senator B and a conversation like this ensues. Well, Senator B, if you'll support my new post office in Mississippi, I'll be more than happy to vote for your bridge to nowhere in Alaska. And they shake their hands and they move forward. Now, imagine that conversation taking place among 100 senators and 435 House members. That's the recipe for disaster. And that's why. They're more concerned about spending borrowed money, your money, to build things in their home districts so then they can get reelected. That's a problem. Because right now we're broke. And it gets even worse. They all tell you this in DC. Earmarks, that's the mechanism by which they say the skids are greased. Have you ever heard that phrase? Mm -hmm. Here's the way it works. Senator B, I need your vote on Obamacare. I don't know. Uh, what about a porn husband kickback? I'm in. You purchase votes with the exchange of earmarks, and that's why the government continues to expand. It's the small rudder that steers the big ship. Earmarks have been controlling the government for far too long. That moratorium is a good thing. Senator Cochran disagrees with me on that, and he said it publicly. He wants those earmarks back. But it begs the question, for what, sir? We are $17.5 trillion in debt. What are you doing? Give that money back to the people. Cut spending. If you want the economy to, again, take off, restore American confidence in the economy by allowing you to keep more of your hard-earned money. You do that, you'll see prosperity. And it's a simple calculation. Mm -hmm. You almost never get the chance to cite Harvard from a study. Harvard isn't exactly a conservative institution, is it? <laughs> but I finally get a chance to cite Harvard. In 2010, during the debate over the Earmark moratorium, Harvard decided to conduct a study. 
The study was to determine whether or not earmarks drove forward economic productivity, whether did it increase local productivity. They were trying to prove that it did. Guess what Harvard found? It didn't work. It decreased economic productivity. It hurt the districts. It was, a, it was a fascinating study as senior members in districts rose in prominence and were more able to deliver earmarks to their districts, economic productivity decreased in those districts. It was the federal spending that was causing a perverse incentive for the states and others not to create the proper economic opportunities, so it was hurting the districts. How strange. That might explain that after 42 years of Senator Crocker being in office, we still remain dead last. Exactly. That's right. It's time for a change. It's time for a new leadership. It's time for a new direction. And if Harvard agrees, I've come a long way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a retired federal government worker. I've been 38 years of service. And here in Mississippi, we've got many government installations, which really provide probably most of the high-tech uh, organizations here in the state. And over Vicksburg, you get the one in Bay St. Louis, and the Keesler Air Force Base, Columbus Air Force Base. Every time there is a inkling of trying to reduce the size of federal government, or whatever it may be, the federal worker takes a hit. Sure. Some of the federal workers in, in the Vicksburg have not had a raise in three or four years. Right. They've not had any, they've gone on sequester uh, and, and lost some days. Uh, are you willing to reduce the government where it really needs to be reduced, like Medicare spending and that kind of thing, sure. and, and not come back on the federal worker all the time? Because, like I said, some of the most high-tech work in, in Mississippi is at these federal uh, installations. Well, let's talk about that. The, the short answer is yes, but I have to explain the background. Milton, it's, it's a root problem. It's a constitutional problem. Just about everything is the else right now. Article 1, Section 8 of the Federal Constitution gives your government every power it's supposed to have. If it's not found in Article 1, Section 8, that power belongs to the states and the people, respectively. The problem is the central government is trying to do too much. It's expanded outside of the contours of Article 1, Section 8. Here's a good example. Military spending is a legitimate function of government, and we should spend as well as we can to take care of our boys and girls in the military. Amen. Yeah. Free cell phones are not no. in the function. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the distinction. There are so many things it's trying to do. It's hurting the things that it should be doing well. If you begin to eliminate all these other issues and focus on what we're supposed to be doing, you'll have what you need to be successful. It's that simple. It's that simple. Now this is a great one because this, this, this gets right into the part of why the Supreme Court is so <coughs> wrong on these school prayer cases. It was roughly 1947 when this all occurred. I'm not going to give you a whole history, but it, it really concerns me. Justice Hugo Black took a phrase out of one of Thomas Jefferson's letters. Thomas Jefferson was writing the Denbury Baptist in 1803 to alleviate their concerns that there was an official church in Connecticut. The Episcopal Patriots. He wrote back, and he was trying to alleviate their concerns, but also respect states' rights, and also use it almost as a piece of campaign literature. Remember, Jefferson was being attacked because he was anti-religious, they said. So he fired it back, and in that phrase said, talked about a separation of church and state. Hugo Black elevated that phrase to constitutionalism by judicial fiat, which is by court order, basically. The court embarked now on this terrible line of decisions. It started in 47, it culminated in 61 and 62, even others up into the 80s, where basically they shut down prayer in public schools. Look at me for a second. Prayer in public schools would not have been considered unconstitutional by your founders. They just wouldn't. If you're an originalist and you look at the First Amendment, you understand the purposes behind the Free Exercise Clause and the Establishment Clause, government should be relatively neutral, particularly the federal government. But the founders would not have found it alarming at all that children were prayed in their schools. It wouldn't be an issue. But the court created a number of tests over the years. And this is where they really messed up. They created such muddled tests, it was difficult to apply that law fairly. And so again, justices usually create tests so they can apply laws arbitrarily. 
Have you ever noticed they, they ignore the plain language of the Constitution and create a test? Then they apply it the way they want to apply it. That's a problem. So what they did, they created this new standard by which we measure all school prayer cases. And it boiled down to a simple <coughs> conclusion. They, they first thought with a captive audience doctrine. These kids can't leave. They, they're stuck. Then they went to the, the football game cases, and they said, that's still kind of a captive audience issue, but more importantly, it could be construed as state-sponsored prayer. Right? The key is, the Supreme Court doesn't want the state to put its fingerprint on the prayer, to okay it. Okay, fine. If my kid prays in school, how's that a state action? If a teacher prays in front of our classroom, some may perceive it as such, that doesn't make it an official state action. Here's the thing. School and prayer is important. I introduced a bill two years ago called Mississippi School Children, uh, Public School Religious Liberties Act. Did you see it? That's what it did. It clarified once and for all that your children do not lose their rights when they go into the schoolhouse door. You don't lose your rights because you walk into a schoolhouse. And the, the left always makes fun of that. They say, well, I always thought I left. No, you didn't lose your rights. The courts made it perfectly clear. If you're disruptive in the schoolhouse door, you can't be disruptive. But your other rights, you, you retain those rights. Right? So your kids walk in, you know what, if they want to wear a necklace that happens to be a cross, that's their business. If they want to do a book report on Jesus Christ, they should be able to do that book report. That's their business. What we're seeing is teachers and administrators looking at this model area of constitutional law, and they were suppressing the speech. Not because they were being anti-religious, they just didn't understand, they thought they were controlling. So what the bill did, it made it perfectly clear that these kids can behave in that fashion without retribution. And secondly, it created what's called a limited public forum so kids can bring graduations and in football games without having the fingerprint of the state on the prayer. And it's done very easily. A little disclaimer. disclaimer. This is not the official position of the state of Mississippi. And the kids still get stuck because he should. That's his right. He didn't leave it when he came to a football game or lose it. I'm a big believer in school prayer. Always will. Chamber of Commerce is spending money against them. 
That's why. It's not the cause of my law practice. I've been a five-day business champion for years. I've been in the legislature. I've got a 95% NFIB rating. I have been for tort reform every time the votes come up. I have fought for pro-business legislation. I've authored some pro-business legislation. That's about amnesty. They need to vote for amnesty. I am not going to support amnesty. Here. Thank you.